All right, hello everyone. My name is Sam Taylor. I'm a USMLE Step 1 tutor at Med School Coach. And this is question of the week. So the case is a 52-year-old woman who comes to the clinic for evaluation of hot flashes. The hot flashes often keep her up at night and distract her while she's at work. She also has been having increasingly irregular periods for the past several years, and her last period was four months ago. She has a history of hypertriglyceridemia and takes no medications. She's prescribed a transdermal patch containing estrogen. Compared to oral, transdermal hormone administration will best mitigate which of the following risks. So at this point, I'll pause and let you guys at home um, take a shot at this, and then whenever you're ready, unpause the video and I'll get on with the explanation. So welcome back. This question is uh, very important for a number of reasons. For one, a recent study found that 50 to 60% of senior residents trained in OB-GYN uh, were not able to prescribe the correct treatment for a menopausal patient. Um, this shows sort of a lack of sufficient training at the medical school and residency levels in menopausal women. Uh, so that makes it a right target for the NBME examiners to uh, put this question on the USMLE exam. The other, the other reason this question is good is that it highlights a few important, very basic concepts that every second year medical student should know that are important for practicing medicine. So without for, further review, let's quickly review the question. This is a 52-year-old uh, woman, 52 as you can imagine is around the time where many women undergo menopause, which is the loss of normal estrogen from their ovaries. And this can manifest in many different ways. One of them is hot flashes due to estrogen withdrawal. Um, the other important thing here is that she has uh, hypertriglyceridemia and takes no medications. So if we were looking for hormone, hormone replacement therapy, one of the things that we would be looking at as a contraindication are uh, previous examples of um, clotting, so a DVT or pulmonary embolism or clotting risk factors. One of those is hypertriglyceridemia. And she's prescribed a transdermal patch containing estrogen. So the crux of the question is, what's the difference between oral and transdermal administration? So to begin, I'm gonna talk a little bit about first pass metabolism. So first pass metabolism is important for a few reasons. And uh, to frame this, let's kind of go through the different pathways a drug is going to have to travel with the two administrations. So we have oral administration on the left and transdermal on the right. So oral, if you're giving a pill or some kind of um, liquid, liquid drug, for example, it's going to first obviously be taken in the mouth, pass through the esophagus and go to the stomach. Once it's in the stomach, it's passed to the intestine. And from the intestine, it goes through portal circulation to reach the liver. So we'll put the portal vein here. And the liver is where a lot of stuff goes on that we'll get into a little more. And after the liver acts upon the drug, it finally enters the bloodstream. And from the blood, it can reach all the other tissues. So the transdermal approach is uh, much simpler. So basically, the way this works is there's a waterproof layer on the outside of the patch, and then the inner layer of the patch is this very spongy um, kind of media that uh, carries the drug and pushes it through the skin. So the first thing the drug comes into contact to is the skin, and then basically it leaks into the skin and reaches the bloodstream directly. So you can see already that there's a much less complicated um, metabolism, at least early on, with the transdermal approach. And so this has a number of ramifications. The biggest one is that Transdermal applications do not pass through the liver. So that leads to the question, what happens at the liver? 
Well, one thing that happens at the liver is that drugs get metabolized. So examples of uh, metabolize, metabolizing in the liver are your phase one and phase two uh, drug metabolism reactions. So briefly, uh, your phase one reactions is mediated, for example, by your cytochrome P450 enzymes. And these are responsible for adding uh, charge to whatever the drug is. And so by adding charge, you make the drug more hydrophilic. And once the drug is hydrophilic, it can be excreted in the urine. So that's kind of the goal of what the liver does. And cytochrome P450s help um, to do that. So they perform reduction and oxidation. Those are uh, two things that can help doing that. And then uh, phase two, you have conjugation. And we'll, there's a number of different kinds of conjugations that go on. So I'll just put conjugation here. And if you want to learn more, you can uh, look at first aid or any of your favorite review resource. So conjugation is the second thing that happens to uh, things getting metabolized by the liver. And the goal is the same thing. So whereas cytochrome P450 added charge, conjugation adds this whole extra complex that itself is very charged. So that um, when you add a glutathione, for example, um, When you add glutathione, this whole species now becomes charged and can be re renally excreted. So because of this metabolizing process, uh, the amount that you need to give in an oral administration is typically higher. And because you're giving these very high doses once in a while, like maybe twice daily or three times daily, you're going to have fluctuating serum levels. So it's going to be high after you take the drug and then lower throughout the the uh, rest of the day. The transdermal avoids that because it's a pretty constant infusion rate uh, throughout the period you are using it. So that's a little bit about first pass metabolism. Um, another important thing about this question is uh, knowing which cancers are associated with estrogen. So unopposed estrogen is a risk factor for two cancers mainly, breast cancer and endometrial cancer. Uh, when I say unopposed, what do I mean by that? I mean estrogen throughout the course of a patient's life that is not balanced by uh, progestins. So progestins actually kind of had an anti-proliferative effect on tissues that would normally proliferate very rapidly with estrogen exposure. So for example, if a patient is taking combined oral contraceptive pills, then they would not necessarily have unopposed estrogen compared to and the second example here, a very obese patient whose um, endogenous androgens are being converted by aromatase in their adipose tissue to estrogen. That would be unopposed. So uh, when you have unopposed um, estrogen exposure, that leads to the growth of estrogen-responsive tissue, mainly breast and endometrial. It turns out that um, endometrial cancer is the larger risk when you're giving hormone replacement therapy. And so that's why in old elderly patients or menopausal women, you would want to balance your estrogen hormone replacement therapy with a progestin if they have a uterus. If they don't have a uterus, it's not a consideration. So given the information we have so far, we can go back to our question and begin eliminating some answers. So with that in mind, let's turn to some of the answer responses. So the question again is asking, compared to oral, transdermal hormone administration best mitigates which of the following risk? So the options we have, A, breast cancer. But how would hormones administered via either of these pathways um, impact breast tissue? Well, in the oral case, they would have to pass through the the mouth, the stomach, the intestines, and pass through the liver to enter the bloodstream, and then the bloodstream would reach the breast tissue, and that's how the breast tissue would get exposed to the estrogens. For transdermal, it goes from the skin to the bloodstream. So when we think about how are these medications dosed, they're dosed according to the amount necessary to get the blood concentration for the effect. So both of these medications are going to be dosed so that the blood concentration is the same. 
the oral dosage total amount given at any one time is going to be high because you have to account for that first pass effect. But once it reaches the blood, it's basically the same between these two. So that's important because all of these cases of cancer risk in peripheral tissues, we wouldn't really expect to be changed with oral versus transdermal hormone administration. And in fact, there is no evidence to suggest that there is a difference. So um, just with that alone, we can rule out, rule out these um, answer responses. Um, but there is a third lesion, it's non-malignant, that is associated with estrogen, and it occurs in the liver. However, it's not hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, this, what I'm talking about, is called a hepatic adenoma. And this is a rather rare lesion, and you see it in two populations. You see it in young women taking oral contraceptive pills, and you also see it in uh, men or women taking uh, androgenic steroids, anabolic steroids. So if sex hormones are exposed at high levels to the liver, it can create this lesion called a hepatic adenoma, which is a highly vascular tumor. It's non-malignant. However, if you were to biopsy this tumor, it could lead to an emergency because it'll bleed. Now, they're very easily treated. You stop the OCPs or you stop the steroids, and they'll generally go away on their own. Now, hepatocellular carcinoma is uh, not related to estrogen exposure, um, but you may have been confused if you were thinking of hepatic adenoma. So we're getting down to the uh, final two, and so I want to return to the content here and talk a little bit about the hormone liver DVT access. So we spoke about how in oral administration, the liver is sometimes exposed to very high levels of drugs. Uh, in the case of um, oral hormone replacement therapy or even OCPs, the liver is exposed to very high amounts of estrogen. When that happens, the liver responds by synthesizing certain proteins. And this is because the liver is the main source of many of the serum proteins in our body. And some of the proteins that the liver synthesizes have very important health effects that we care about in the hospital and in the clinic. So one of the things the liver synthesizes is sex hormone binding globulin. So sex hormone binding globulin does exactly as the name suggests, it binds excess sex hormones. So if you're giving a patient exogenous estrogen, it turns out that the amount that gets bound by the protein the estrogen induces is pretty negligible. But sex hormone binding globulin also binds the patient's endogenous androgens. And so this theoretically could actually lead to some symptoms of hypoandrogenism in women. That usually means low libido. Another thing produced by the liver that we care a lot about is um, coagulation factors. And it turns out that estrogen induces the uh, production of certain coagulation factors that lead a patient to become prothrombotic. This is why OCPs, for example, are a risk factor for um, events of venous thromboembolism and subsequent pulmonary embolism. So the coagulation factors is a really big risk we care about in the liver. Uh, the liver also produces uh, cortisol binding globulin. And so this can um, bind to free cortisol and the adrenals will pump out more cortisol to compensate. So in women under OCPs or getting hormone replacement therapy, um, you can actually see increased total cortisol levels, but the level of free cortisol is relatively constant. And the same is also true for thyroid bonding, binding globulin as well. So with all, all that in mind, let's return to our question here. So D, pulmonary embolism. So we talked about how oral administration exposes the liver to higher amounts of whatever drug you're giving. In this case, we're giving estrogen. If the liver is exposed to a higher amount of estrogen with an oral administration compared to transdermal, 
it would make sense that it would produce more uh, prothrombotic coagulation factors. And indeed, that's true. So the current recommendations from the American Society of Endocrinology is actually to begin women on transdermal hormone administration, especially if they have risk factors for venous thromboembolism. In this case, this patient has a risk factor in hypertriglyceridemia. So pulmonary embolism definitely seems like a very good answer at this point. Now let's turn finally to E, dementia. Now this is an interesting idea because hormone replacement therapy has been investigated as a treatment or preventative measure against dementia because sex hormones have been found to be protective against elderly adults developing dementia. However, hormone replacement therapy is not currently prescribed for this indication and neither oral nor transdermal affect really a change in the level of peripheral tissues or the level of drug peripheral tissues are exposed to, as I described. So it would not have any different effect on dementia either. So the correct answer is pulmonary embolism. Thank <laughs> you.